Welcome to the Culture Chat, hosted by WorkExo. Our mission is to upgrade work. Find out more about our workplace genome project at WorkExo.com. And now, over to our host for today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition uh, of the Culture Chat podcast. My name is Jamie Nodder. I'm a founding partner at WorkXO. I am here as usual with my partner, Charlie Judy. Charlie, how's it going? It's going well, man. Good to, good to hear your voice. As, as you were just saying before we hit record, it's been a while since we've done one of these, so I'm glad to be back. Yes, yes very excited. Uh, I'm excited about today's topic, too. Um, we have Stephanie Waite with us, um, and she is going to be talking. We're going to get more into the details of the uh, topic in a minute, but we're talking about customization, which is something that is um, near and dear to my heart. We've actually built it into a lot of the culture work we do um, and something that I've been writing about for a long time. So uh, I'm super excited to hear from someone who's actually doing it, uh, which always is more interesting than, uh, than just people who sort of write and think and talk about it. I don't know who those people would be, but maybe it'd be me. But um, so Charlie, you know Stephanie better than I do, so I'm gonna kick it over to you to sort of set it up and get us going. Yeah, so um, uh, really, really psyched to have Stephanie here. Uh, I first met Stephanie on the stage for Disrupt HR Chicago. I think you were part, you were part of the the second event that we hosted. Um, and uh, as I uh, listened to the things you had to say uh, about the world that you live in and the organization that you're with, um, it struck me that there are lots of things that that uh, you focus on that tie almost immediately to culture, even though culture is not in your title or necessarily part of your uh, explicit job description. Uh, Stephanie is the director of leadership and OD or organizational development for the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago, which is an iconic institution, really a world-class uh, one of the, uh, most prominent uh, children's hospital in hospitals in the world, and the staff, the the breadth, the diversity of people that you're working with and helping to become more successful is is just really staggering, and I think speaks to, or I, I, we're just really interested to hear about how you're how you deal with that, and and we're guessing some of that has to do with customization. So we'll get to that big question, but why don't you just share a little bit more about who you are, Steph, and um, and then we'll. Uh, we'll get into the dialogue. So thanks again for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited um, just to sort of have the dialogue with you all about culture and, and sort of how it's working here in the healthcare space, especially in a pediatric healthcare institution. Um, but what I think is most important is I don't have a medical background or a healthcare background. Um, mine actually comes from education and actually in the science space. Um, and I think that's when I first learned about um, sort of customization and thinking about how people um, sort of behave and think differently um, to create this sort of larger culture, um, not only within um, an institution, but also within our community. Um, so for me, um, my background, as you guys know, is in education. Um, I went to UW-Madison, super Badger fan, so shout out to all my Badgers out there. Yeah. Um, ended up being, I know, right? Um, even the Big Ten, I'm a big fan. Um, so really long story short, um, I love science and really thinking differently um, with a really um, high risk and at risk population and ended up just really getting involved in how other people learn um, and, and travel quite extensively internationally to learn that. Um, and then came back to the Chicagoland area, um, was getting my master's, worked for a number of um, really interesting corporate, um, private and public um, organizations and learned so much about people and just these dynamic um, cultures that, that institutions have to really drive not only their business and bottom line, but also to sort of set a precedent of um, where they want to be long term. And so for me, um, really at the core of uh, sort of my philosophy is really just helping people get to where they want to be. So while my title, Charlie, you alluded to, doesn't have culture in it, um, I think when we think about helping people get to where they want to be, it's really through um, three main things. Um, and these actually um, are the three main frameworks that we use here at Lurie Children's in leadership and organizational development. And those are really focusing on formal leadership development opportunities. Um, we actually use the term customized, um, which is, I think, why we're talking today. Um, we do customized leadership development opportunities, and then also looking at our third arm, which is really around long-term change initiatives. So really within the formal space, we have a university system that we just created um, just a few years ago. Um, and then the customized leadership development, we really focus on coaching, really that one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of 
that individual itself, um, really helping and supporting them through sort of a, a long-term um, issue or, or something that they come to us with. And then consultation, so really a one-on-one -on -one, um, approach, but for something larger than just that individual coming to us. And then last but not least, we're looking at customization from a facilitation perspective. What, what do we need to come in? What do we need to do with the team? Not just us as an individual, but how do we create new and long lasting behavior change so that when we leave and we come out, individuals are still doing the same thing, if not even better than when we <laughs> were already in there. Um, so I feel really lucky. That's awesome. So, I mean, you kind of jumped right into the answers before we even got to the questions, exactly. which, I mean, I, I think we might just turn this over to you entirely. Uh, this is, this is the, I'm going to grab a coffee. Stephanie, Stephanie podcast. <laughs> right. no, it, well, I guess the long the short of it is, is I'm really responsible for um, setting and implementing this strategy and uh, vision for leadership and organizational development here um, and really optimizing the experiences for our leaders and I think what might be important to note is really defining who we think a leader is. Um, so that might be helpful. And um, we have about 500, a little bit under, formal leaders, which include clinical, non-clinical, everybody from all walks of life in a formal leadership position. And that is manager title and above. So all the way and up through the executive team. And then in addition, um, just our philosophy here at Lurie Children's is we have a little bit over 4,500 employees, and really our team serves all 4,500 employees because we truly believe that everybody is a leader. Um, and so those people who would love to use us as a resource, we're really there for them. Interesting. So I, I've got a question actually um, sort of on this topic of customization and 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 really the, the question that I would have asked about two minutes ago before you started giving yeah. good answers is, is ta really just to talk about this, this philosophy of, of a culture of customization, really describing what it is, but also how you apply it in the workplace because that's, I think, the interesting piece. And one of the things that I have talked about or what interested me about the concept of customization is that in this day and age, we wrote about it, Maddie and I, in, in When Millennials Take Over, in the digital age, everything is, you expect it to be customized, right? Like, what's the first thing you need to get your phone? You, like, customize the settings. Like, we, we customize everything. And the trick, though, is that everyone gets to customize now, or maybe not everyone, but, like, the broad market gets to customize. In the old days, customization was something for the elite. Like, yeah, sure, you'll customize stuff for the top of your org chart, but not everyone else can do that because it's too hard. So I'm curious to hear how, I mean, you talk about serving the 4,500 employees. Are, is, is, there, is there customization that is sort of available to the masses in your context? Yes. Um, so the short answer is yes, um, <laughs> right? Um, and I totally agree with you. I think um, that's why... You know, really our team and um, when I came into this role about um, three years ago or so, really thinking about, again, that individualization, which um, leads to really that customization, but allowing people to really think about my own leadership development. Because we know from a behavior change and sort of an educational perspective, especially in the adult um, world, you know, we want ownership over where we're going to go. And sometimes we just need help in setting that beacon and that goal long term. And then really what is available to us, we want to sort of create our own path to achieve that goal. And therefore, we see tons of high buy-in. Um, we see long-term behavior change for those people who take advantage of it. We really think about ourselves and looking at and taking in all of the information and data that we can see within the organization internally, then also looking externally to see where are things going down the line. What is sort of um, the next step from a, a leadership development standpoint? What's the next step for us and how do we stay competitive within our industry? And really that's up to our team to really design out our strategy, think about and let those really I would say leadership competencies and behaviors really percolate to see what's going to be most relevant for them now. And I think that's sort of step one, right? And what's relevant now is because we're thinking about what behaviors do they need to build for the future? And so it's a sort of, you know, chicken or the egg thing, right? Do you think about how, what culture you want down the road or what types of leaders you want down the road and then provide it now? Or do you think about what immediate needs they have now and develop out what the culture is that we think we're going to need down the road? So I would say that's sort of just the, the context and the, the pretext to it. So, so in our so, world. So, so, okay. but, sorry to interrupt. So, so before, before you go a whole lot further, and then I've got a kind of an add on question to this, but, but I, I want to hear because, because all of us aren't, aren't, aren't as, as smart as you and, and certainly haven't spent the time in this particular space that you have. Give us, give, give us a couple of examples of how, like how you can touch and feel and see 
and experience customization in the kinds of even just the programmatic work that you're offering for your for your employees. Give us a couple of real yeah. life examples. Yeah, exactly. So one thing we're going to really um, hype up on this year is um, the concept of 70, 20, 10 plans. Mm. I'm not sure um, if you guys are familiar with those, but it actually comes from the education space. Um, and the Center for Creative Leadership does a lot of work with, with this sort of concept. And what this allows people to do, um, the idea or the concept is that 70, 20, 10, when you add it up, is 100%. What we say is, and what that concept is, is that in order to get 100% of our learning, we have to do things within the 70, 20, and 10 space. And what that looks like is they say 10%, no matter how much you do, we glean away or glean 10% of our knowledge from coursework and training. So that's like podcast, which we're on now. That is, you know, reading a book, um, going to a lecture series. It's really kind of that didactic space where the individual learner is operating for, with sort of an upload or download sort of experience. Then we look at the 20%. The 20% is really what they call developmental relationships. That would be, you know, going and meeting with somebody for a coffee and talking about the specific concept. Um, you know, meeting with a group of individuals and having a book club. Really socializing the idea and being able to apply it in context. And then where you get the most bang for your buck is really in the 70% space. And that's the experiential learning space or what we call challenge assignments. What that looks like is, as much as you do, you, you'll sort of glean 70% of your knowledge from experiential learning opportunities. So the idea here is that no matter what goal or what you're trying to do or what you're trying to learn, the individual learner can customize his or her experience to meet the same goal. So for example, if an individual was interested in maybe a practice manager role, maybe they're in a coordinator role now, a goal that they could have would be increased knowledge in practice manager um, uh, you know, sort of role, if you will. A 70-20-10 plan then, we would work with that individual and really customize with that individual, where are they now getting an understanding? Do they even know what practice manager is? Are they able, have they met with one before? Or is this just sort of a, a dream that they're, you know, sort of saying, that's my next step because I think that's my next step. So it gives us a coaching opportunity and a consultative opportunity to really individualize and customize for the actual learner. So what that would look like is 10%, yep. maybe going on to the job descriptions and understanding what a practice manager actually does. And not just here at Lurie Children's, but around the country, because maybe a practice manager role may have different responsibilities in different cities or in different institutions. That's just one small snippet of a 10%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In addition, it, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep going. I want to, I want to hear an example about the 20 and the 70, and then I got a, then I got a follow on question. Yeah, you bet. So in the 20% role, I may have them and we may talk about going out and interviewing three practice managers from three specific areas that they may be really interested in with a set of questions, you know, that they could, they were able to really understand and talk about this practice manager role. Again, creating these developmental relationships. And then the 70% may be going out and shadowing for a couple of days or even a you know, depending on their time, maybe a full day or even a week if they can. And during that time, they actually act as a practice manager. So really giving them either one small snippet or one small goal that a practice manager does and letting them sort of handle it within the safe space of being shadowed by uh, another practice manager. Yeah. And the idea here is that they complete that in a really customized and individualized uh, sort of plan, if you will, they're able to really uh, meet their goal. And this plan may be 100% different for somebody else who might be in a different arena. So I mean, it's awesome, awesome example um, to see it all the way through. And I, I love the 70, 20, 10 thing. Um, so all of that to me sounds awesome in principle. And, you know, certainly mm -hmm. I, I, I um, subscribe to this idea that, that, um, we, we have to be thinking about a customized learning experience in order for any of it to really stick. Um, but what do you, what does the organization have to let go of, um, in order to make that happen? I mean, so, so maybe that's, maybe it's let go, maybe it's obstacles. What, what are the challenges? I mean, I think about, you know, Jamie started this with this example of when you buy your phone, you can customize it, um, meet the settings immediately, but, the phone doesn't tell you, no, you know what? You shouldn't pick those settings because those aren't right. Like, no, I, this is what I like. I like blue. Um, you know, how, how far does the, does the individual get to go in customizing this? Is there a balance? Is, do you still have to have control and oversight and all of that other stuff? Help us understand that a little bit. Yeah, that's such a great question, Charlie. Um, so, 
and again, these are my bias and sort of assumptive opinions as well. So um, I'm not speaking on behalf necessarily of Lurie Children's, but more as an OD practitioner and, 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 and thinking about this concept of how do we build culture. So obviously within any institution, really, as I said earlier, the main driver for us is really looking at the organizational vi vi vision, excuse me, um, and the strategy of the organization. So we have a pretty clear um, set of goals that the organization is trying to achieve, along with little mini strategies that align with that. What I look at every year is how does leadership and organizational development support that? So when it comes back to offering customization for our leaders, I think one of the things that we really try to do is we offer a buffet of options, but keeping in mind that everything from soup to nuts is going to be on there. So when you think about it, we really offer them options that are all directionally correct, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's really up to them to self-assess in addition to understanding how we as an LOD team can help them assess where are they on that continuum of building competency and capabilities? So what we're really doing with customization, really the outcome is teaching leaders how to be self-directed and take ownership and take the lead over their own development. Right. So we actually say in the long term or the long, grand scheme of things is it's not necessarily what we offer to you here within Larry Children. That's, a, that's an amazing opportunity. And we expect you, as you're going out to external venues, going to conferences, going to things that might be experiential, or meeting with other you know, mentors at other institutions, you're coming back and you're understanding how that fits within your overall schema of our leadership competencies, capabilities, and behaviors. So that's really actually the behavior that we're going for, rather than teaching them to customize their own long-term, I like blue, and it's a totally different color blue. Got it. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing really is thinking about the organization, um, to, to answer your question before, what does the organization need to let go? I think typically within any organization and, and any time we're taught as leaders, the traditional sort of framework, and again, my own and my humble opinion, is really telling people how to do it and what to do so they can be successful. And what I've deemed that as is really process-based leadership which um, a very uh, kind euphemism would be micromanaging, right? Is this, here's how to do it, here's a process that you need to do, and then if they don't do it, we course correct along the way. Mm. What, we, what I'm trying to flip is what we call to outcomes-based leadership. And outcomes-based leadership is I'm giving you this beacon, this bullseye, this set of competencies. I need you to show me evidence of how you're going to get there, and then I'll sort of help cu customize and coach along the way to help you get to the outcome. Regardless if you take a huge, you know, zig right or a huge zig left. And really thinking about, again, how do we teach people to create these behaviors now so we're directionally correct rather than actually doing the process that we've set forth? Yeah, yeah I, got, I just want to, like, emphasize the importance, um, or not even the importance, but uh, I, the, how impressed I am, actually, at the – clarity that you're reflecting around knowing knowing what drives your success as an as an organization um this is something charl we we hit this with almost every single one of our clients when we're talking to them about culture we remind them oh by the way and to design the really perfect culture for you for your organization it should be aligned with what drives your success and we're like mm -hmm. so can you just can you tell us what drives your success and we get lots of pretty vague answers <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, yes. And it's, it's, and they do the work. It's fun to do the work actually when they, when they, when they really get clear on it. Um, but that's like the, that's the anchor. That's the, that's what sets your parameters and your limits and what you have to let go of and what you can't let go of. Um, and, and I just, I don't know, you sort of put it out there like, well, yeah, we have these success drivers and these mini strategies and we just, I'm like, Hey, whoa, like <laughs> credit for that because I think that's really hard work. I think it's, I think it's, it's a, uh, it's a big piece of culture work. I think they could say. Well, and what Stephanie's not talking about, or I'm sure she, I mean, I'm sure it's happening, but what she, what she hasn't alluded to is that it, it, it also goes beyond just telling everybody what those success drivers are or what those, those, uh, th those values or visions are for that matter it's reinforcing it at every turn and you can hear in the way stuff he talks about it, that that's mm -hmm. resolutely they come back to it again and again and again, which is important. Well, yeah, no, yeah, it's, definitely, no. it's definitely something, sorry, it's definitely something we see in the organizations with the stronger cultures is that kind of clarity. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it, and it actually it's sort of similar to that almost take it for granted clarity. Like, well, of course, doesn't everybody do it this way? Doesn't everyone mm -hmm. know what their success drivers are? Mm -hmm. well, anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> 
Yeah. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I really attribute that. I've had such amazing mentors and such an amazing community, including Charlie, you with the Dust Disrupt HR um, community and just you, even you're on my conversations and just everybody that's um, come across my path and I've come across their path, just really trying to glean, you know, how they've gotten to that success place as well. And, you know, I just feel so lucky to have such an amazing network of people who have helped me shape, I think, the, the vision and, and sort of how to sort of connect these things. And I think that's a, that's a huge piece of it is really surrounding yourself with people who are willing to share these ideas. And that's why I love that um, you guys asked me to be on here. I, I couldn't be more humbled and, and more thankful that I'm able to now hopefully influence, even if it's just one person, um, to, to sort of think a little bit differently about how they drive their own um, culture development. Yeah, so, so um, and, and of course, uh, everybody now has a free invitation to reach out to you, Stephanie. So you've just made yourself public. <laughs> um, yes, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, so we are, we're coming up on around 20 minutes, and we try to keep this the, the length of a, an average dog walk or commute. So um, as much, the, the, there's so much more to talk about. Um, let's see if we can capstone this a, a, a little bit. Um, what, as you think about kind of where you're placing your bets going forward, where you or Luris are, are, are placing your bets going forward, um, tell us a little bit about kind of connecting this idea of customization to other parts in your organization. Because I, I, I know you're, I know that you're not just in this little tight box of OD. Um, where, where else do you see that popping up as it relates to your culture or your employment experience? Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, there's a lot. Um, I have a few thoughts. I think maybe what's important to define first is really, you know, this, this word culture is so provocative. And I think this, this word customization is starting to become provocative as well. I think for me, you know, really that culture is that vibe and, you know, including this idea of, you know, sort of this assumption that it's okay for everybody and individually because they're going to be uh, going to have to be okay to, to sort of have this vibe that they bring that really coalesces to build this larger culture, right? And so I think for, for us, we're starting to build these small little sort of pockets of individuals who think in this way and, and really our job as a, as a leadership development team is really to help people parallel and also transfer these same sort of mental models and concepts and development onto their own people and that which then in turn for us means it's going to the patients and the doctors like and yeah. right and and so for me I think you know people say you know do you directly connect with the patients and I say every day right I see them in the hallways I see them in the elevators and, and I think for me where I'm placing my bet is long term if there was a way that I could you know really successfully and um, uh, sort of in, in a valid and reliable way understand how leadership development, we're really building this culture of dynamic leaders who, whether or not they stay with us, which we would love, or go to other organizations, they say from a talent life cycle perspective, man, our leadership and organizational development program, this built me into or has helped me get to where I am right now as a leader that I'm, you know, that I am. And um, I think that's what I think I want our legacy to be. Um, and I think, um, you know, when we think about sort of the cultural phenotype um, of blurry children's, we're actually undergoing a little bit of cultural work now um, of our internal brand and really explicitly defining what our values are. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about, you know, Ed Shine's work and, and a lot of his, you know, defining the artifacts and the values and, and the assumptions, really values are a huge key piece. So from a talent lifecycle perspective, it's not just leadership and organizational development. It transcends across performance management, succession management. Um, it translates across every single system and infrastructural piece that we have at the institution where everybody's aligning their decisions or driving their decisions through this values framework. And, and to me, that's really the impetus for, for long-term cultural change. Um, so Sorry. I think I, I would say that. Yeah, I, listen, I'm, I'm sorry to be like your number one fan uh, on this uh, <laughs> podcast, but I also, I, I want to give some credit here. Well, I I just feel like this conversation is kind of like a graduate school level culture conversation. Mm, yeah, this is this should be like, <laughs> when, we, is, when we list it on the, pod, on the Podbean site, it's got to like go in its own special column. Yes, you have to have it. You have to, there's prerequisites for this one. You have to oh have done Oh my gosh, you're so kind. <laughs> well, because the, the specifically, the, and I'm not, I'm going to misquote you, but, but a minute ago you talked about finding or creating and nurturing these, these pockets of individuals that think this way and you talked about the mental models like yeah. that's advanced culture 
because it, and it's you know it's our definition of a culture includes it's all the words actions thoughts and stuff that sort of clarify and reinforce what's valued that thoughts piece is about the assumptions it's about the mental models and and that stuff drives behavior and people don't sort of get that like i it's fine to work on those values i think that's important those are the words you're using to describe your culture but if you if those words are inconsistent are not aligned really with the underlying mental models that people are sharing and sort of propagating uh that's where it gets tough and so you guys you guys have taken it down to that level and i think that's pretty cool yeah. yeah, and I think that's where we've seen the biggest drive, right? And that's where I think really, you know, I feel so blessed to have been in the education space, um, both, you know, trans- transcending across multiple levels, um, but really understanding differentiation and understanding, you know, I had students with special needs, students that came from extremely high-risk families, um, and then, you know, students that, that didn't. And, it, you know, you had them all in the classroom together, and it wasn't, you know, looking at them that someone had a deficit or someone had an advantage, but looking at them each individually as how do we really get them all to achieve this sort of outcome that we set? And that's really going and meeting them where they are and and really understanding and assessing. And and that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And I think one of the other biggest things is it takes a lot of care, right? You, You really have to care about people and the work that you're doing um, because all day we can talk about passion and we can talk about I can do this and I read 15 books on it but I think at the end of the day really understanding how individuals are motivated to do things um, and that's also I think I'll leave it at this is um, everything we do is never forced we don't do any forced coaching we don't do any forced you know quote-unquote interventions we really focus on we're a resource and we're here to support you through any development that you need And if we can't do it, we will help you point you in the right direction. And we really give people the choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, And Charlie, you asked this question earlier around what does the organization need to let go? And I think sometimes it, you know, it might be the idea that we have to keep everybody here and retain them. I think we really want a true culture that we can be explicit about and the expectations that we're really confident about. And that we really want to attract those people that are going to help us live that. And we know that culture comes in cycles um, and being okay with that, I think is probably for any institution or any organization, something that um, it has been a really powerful sort of core value of mine. Yeah. I, I mean, again, you're going to, you're going to open the, the floodgates on uh, either future fo- uh, podcasts or, you know, uh, a podcast that's going to last, last longer than the 20 minutes we've assigned. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I want to make just one final thought and then we, we can shut this baby down. But, um, you know, this whole idea, I mean, you know, as I reflect on what you shared with us today, none of it was about like, we've got this program and that program and this policy and that policy and this really cool technology. It was about like shifting behavior and conditioning responses and sharing ideas and, and kind of giving people the, like the fundamental tools to make good decisions themselves about um, moving along this path, this developmental path. Uh, and I'm not doing it justice, but that's, that's really um, what you're focused on. And I think that's, that's, that's so important. The other thing, this whole idea of just giving up any sort of, uh, any sort of care or investment in or, or focus on retention like that. That's, that's, that's an outcome. We know that like, that's great. If we can, if we can get the right kind of retention, but if you can just stay focused on what you know is right for your organization to drive the success of your organization, all of those things are going to come out. The way you'll retain, you'll retain yeah. the right people and the, and the, and the right people that need to leave will get the heck out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, All let's right. get back to the philosophy, the philosophy of self-selection and really opting in yep. and choosing to be yeah. here and being motivated. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So it turns out that even really cool graduate level courses do come to an end. Uh, and, and the same is true with this particular uh, edition of our podcast. I want to thank everyone for listening, of course. And Stephanie, I really want to thank you for joining us. This has been great. Um, we will have to, 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 to come up with another big question to, uh, to ping you on in the future, I think, for another, for another episode. Um, for those of you that are regular listeners, you know where to find us. Uh, if, if you found us uh, and you're new to this and you found us on Podbean, don't forget to look on, get subscribed on the iTunes piece. Don't forget that we also do a blog post making reference to this over on the WorkXO site. Um, and we'll probably be posting some additional content related to that uh, on that site as well. So, so make sure you check that out. Uh, and so until next time, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Charlie, as usual. And we will see you again on the Culture Chat podcast.
Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm so, so thankful. And that was the Culture Chat today. We'll have some highlights up on the blog soon. Find out more about WorkXO and how to map your workplace genome at WorkXO.com.